I'm done. Take it away. Sorry. Take it away, Mr. Keith Park. Thank you, thank you. Keith Parker. <laughs> CWNE number three. Man, he used up 12 seconds of my time, you see. Hi. Uh, name's Keith Parsons on the thing. I run a company called Wireless Land Pros. Glad to be here to talk a little bit about counterintuitive Wi-Fi. There's a bunch of things in Wi-Fi that we think we know. We feel really sure we know. And then all of a sudden we don't. And so these are things professionals should know, but many don't. And even those of us who do sometimes forget, or sometimes we actually forget on purpose because it's a little easier. Uh, me, I do Wi-Fi. That's kind of pretty simple. Have a website, wmpros.com. Lots of free resources out there. You want to go take a hit. Now, yeah, this is just remind me. I do have a home. <laughs> this is looking out of my backyard. And I get to see it a couple times a year. So counterintuitive, something that is counter to intuitive. That kind of makes sense, right? There's a whole bunch of things like this. They're almost oxymoronic, things like uh, military intelligence, giant shrimp, uh, other things that fit in that category. But they're actually true. We do have giant shrimp. And there are people in the military who are intelligent. And we do have things that are counterintuitive in Wi-Fi. So let's go back in history. World War II. The British and Americans are sending bombers into Germany, and they keep getting shot up. And they think, if we lower the payload of our bombs a little bit, we could armor them up. And if we armor them, then maybe more of them will come back. So they thought, let's go and put a little piece of tape and count every time we have a plane come back with a bullet hole in it. So they send off the planes. They come back. They have bullet holes. They go and mark them all. They put them on a big map, and they say, we should really armor those places. And you look at it for a while, and they couldn't figure it out. They went, wow, we have a lot of places on the plane to, to, to armor. I don't know if we can armor them all. Which of those do you think is most important? And they start looking at the really places where there are high density of holes. Maybe that's a, a statistical anomaly. And they say, ooh, statistics. I bet if we could get a statistician, they could help us. So the military guy is tracked down the statistician, and he looks at this, and he's looking at it, and he's going, and he has his friends to together, and they have a whole meetings, and they're thinking about it. How are we going to armor these planes? And one young statistician looks at it and goes, well, you know what's missing is all the bullet holes of the planes that didn't come back. Maybe that's where we should put the armor. They have all this data. They have lots of information. And it's counterintuitive to put it where the bullet holes aren't until you think a little more about it. So we're going to think about a couple things with Wi-Fi, if the clicker works. OK, one more time. Um, I think this Xerus is messing with everyone's clickers. Um, <laughs> part of, I'm not, it's not just my clicker, other clickers. Um, if you have a chance, I'd like to recommend books. Here's a good book. Uh, by Chip and Dan Heath. It's called Made to Stick. I think it's a great book. If you're a teacher at all, if you want to communicate any information to anyone else, get Made to Stick. It's about how to make ideas sticky. And part of what we want to do in helping our customers understand Wi-Fi a little better is give them sticky ideas. So here's an idea to think of. Mr. Clicker. We have some vulnerabilities about Wi-Fi. So I ask a question out to the audience. Not quite as much as Glenn. So, like, you had like this whole organized thing. I just posted up on Twitter. Two people answered, and I just cut just this little teeny snippet of conversation about what are things that are counterintuitive. And I got this whole list. So we're going to go through some of them here. I think it wants me to stand close. They like each other. First. Client wants to connect. And I've been using this slide for 15 years. It's old. But it hasn't changed in 15 years. And the idea about this slide is there's a bunch of communications going back and forth. But the entire decision of what AP I should join is inside the client. So back when I first made this, the graphic artist asked me, 
well, we should label. I said, you should put a diamond there because in flow charting, diamonds mean decision, and thus there's a thing there. And she goes, well, what color should I make it? Well, we've used blues and purples. Uh, let's just make it green. So for 15 years, it's been called the green diamond. Now, I call it the green diamond because it's a very simple, sticky idea to remind people of. And we're going to play a game here. Ready? You guys in the front row are my contestants. I can't read. Man, the lights are. I can't even see. First person, name? Gustavo. Gustavo. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> Gustavo, you're a client. You just woke up. <laughs> you said, oh, man, look at all these APs. You've been listening. You hear beacon, 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 beacon from all these APs. You wake up. You send out a probe request, and you get back 17 probe responses. Mr. Gustavo, how do you choose which AP is best, and you can only give them only one metric? RSSI, thank you very much. Next up, your name? I can't read that. There's, a, there's like a flashlight in my face. Adam, you send out a probe request. You get back 17 probe responses. How do you determine which AP is best? No, there, you have to come up with a new answer. <laughs> SNR, problem is, N's the same for everyone. So really, it's S. Joel, how do you come up with it? Well, you said my I know, and that's what. Now, I wanted to just start and just do a quick little play this game. We should be able to get halfway through this row and not repeat an answer because we keep thinking this thing's all about RSSI. It's not. SNR, SSID, what's the probability? What in your SSID stack is it? Am I talking to you now? Have I talked to you before? Are you in my whitelist? Am I on my blacklist? Are you on the channel I like? What on the band I like? The security system I like? The authentication system I like? There is a huge, huge list. And the vendors who invent green diamonds spend an inordinate amount of time making those green diamonds do exactly what they want them to do. Second one in. Name? Jack. Jack. Oh, sorry, Jay. Jay. If you were designing an Apple TV, would you want your Apple TV to be sticky or not sticky? And that's something that happens in the green diamond, in decision choice. You're in an apartment complex. You have neighbors all around you. You connect yours up. You don't want it to move over to some neighbor who just happened to buy the latest new Nighthawk. So we purposely think about that and make them different. So one of the counterintuitive things is every vendor's, and not just vendor, every vendor's product line inside their product lines use get different green diamonds. We think we're designing Wi-Fi for Wi-Fi. That's intuitive. That's what your customers think. But in all reality, every single client does this differently, wildly differently. So I could go through this, and I've got a video of it. If you want to watch the video, it's about 10 minutes long. Just send me an email. My email's at the end of the slide. And I'll send you this video that we professionally recorded going over something like this. If I have BPSK, I'm only going to be able to send one bit. The bit's either going to be a sine wave or a cosine, uh, or sorry, or a minus sine wave. If it's a sine wave, it peaks at 90 degrees. If we just plotted that same sine wave on a different curve, on a polar curve, it comes around and it's right here. That's the one, 90 degrees down, 90 degrees over, 90 degrees down. If it was a minus, uh, sorry, a zero, it would be a minus sine wave over at 270. The purple little box here, and this is way better and easier to understand when you see it live and it kind of grows, is our EVM, or our error vector magnitude, is we could have anything on this side of the line and it's still a one. So when your Wi-Fi is using BPSK, it's extremely resilient. It can handle tons of interference, but has a problem. It only lets you do one bit, one bit at a time. It's really slow. If we're going to go faster. We go to two bits, and now we have to add not just sines and minus sines, but cosines and minus cosines to get this mix. And then if I wanted to have this one one, it's 45 degrees. So I combine a sine and a cosine together, get it at 45, shows up here. I also have the EVM box. I'm sending twice as many bits, so my EVM box gets half as big. I want to go faster still. So we go to 16 bits. We're also using the same ones and zeros. We're using the same sine wave, cosine waves, minus signs, minus cosine signs. 
to get 45 degrees high amplitude, 45 degree low amplitude, which gives us these two numbers. This one now has a smaller EVM box. We don't think about when we say, oh, we just you know, downshifted our data rate. Well, why? What happened? Well, what happened was we have a big EVM, a smaller EVM, a really small EVM, and a tiny EVM. And thus, previous speaker said, and we don't even design for 256 qualm because EVM's so tiny, tiny, small. We already have this slide, so we can skip it. That same slide, though, turned on its side, has a different meaning. As I get more and more differential between my noise floor and my signal, and my noise floor and my signal, and my noise floor and my signal, I get to have a faster qualm. It's pretty simple. Who controls S? Any of you on your controllers can change your transmit power? We control the signal strength. Who controls N? Shut up. Who controls N? My S is your N. That's if we're two different companies and we have two different APs. But if I'm a single ma manufacturer in a single building and I have a controller that has all the APs in this hotel, my S is also my N. We control the N. So many people think, oh, yeah, it's the microwave ovens. Really? We have energy detect and preamble detect in what uh, Tom was just talking about. Energy detect is way more, sorry, reverse. Preamble detect is way more sensitive than energy detect. We're so much more sensitive to other people talking than we are to other things that aren't talking. So another counterintuitive thing. We got faster in cable. We went from silver satin to twisted pair to cat three, cat five, cat five E, and we went from, I don't know, one meg to 10 meg to 100 meg to a gig. We're a thousand times faster on our cable. And how did we go a thousand times faster? Did we have better copper? Are the electrons going faster than the speed of light? Did we make the cable shorter? We lowered interference. It's the interference that was causing the cables. We used to have the cables that wrapped together. They went together. And then we changed so we have one going fast and one going slow. I had to practice that. One going fast, one going slow. Try it. Come on. It's not an easy thing to do. It's like doing your foot at the same time. We lowered interference, and we made the cable go faster. So guess how we make Wi-Fi go faster? lower interference. And who causes N? We do. So we're in control over this. Now, MCS index chart. Crazy thing. I love it. It's one of my favorite things. Unlike Devin, who I could point to any place here and he could tell me the number, I tested him. He actually has this memorized. I'm not worthy. I cannot do that. But the idea is we think, and the intuitive part says, we are a, let's say we're 80 megahertz wide client, and we can do 866. So during the association process, I call up to the AP and say, hey, Mr. AP, this is what I can do. What can you do? Well, the AP answers purpose, well, I can do this and this and this and this. And we have a little negotiation. I say, yeah, that's good. I can do this. You can do this. Let's find a little subset that we can both do. Now in the client, I only have to remember my box because I'm only associated to one table. But in the AP side, and one of the reasons why enterprise class APs need to have big CPUs and a lot of RAM to hold all this, they have to remember the table for every single client that they're on. That's just to start. And now let's say I'm a client and I come in and I associated 866. The AP can do 866, I can do 866, we're nice and happy, and we go, yes, we're ready to go. I send my first data frame at 866, which means, we look at the details, it's 80 megahertz wide, SGI is turned on, I happen to be using a MCS of nine, two spatial streams, 256 qualm, and a 506 coding. Whew. That's a lot of stuff to say. That's why we have MCS tables, so we don't have to say all that stuff. 
We just say I'm a 80 megahertz MCS9. Short, short hand for saying this. Now I have, I have a choice. The transmitter, in this case I'm going to come from the client side first, the transmitter says I can do this, the AP told me he can do it, let's give it a try. Bam, send it out with those features. The radio wave goes through the air, since it's a 256 qualm, it's got a little, little teeny, teeny, teeny EVM, and I have a very, very precise radio wave. The radio wave goes out, hits the thing, and says, boom, the AP hears it, and he sends me back an ACK. And now the transmitter says, that worked. I will continue to send 866 with all those features. At some point, something changes. Could be the client moves. Could be more traffic on the thing, could be noise, could be anything, and I go, data, no ACK. 256, no ACK. 256, no ACK. And again, like I said, every client has a different green diamond. Every client plays the MCS game a different way, too. Some of them do the following, and you can track this with packet captures. They will go 866, 866, four times, and the fifth one go, ah, didn't work. I should go to BPSK 6.5. Fast, 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 ultimate slow. And you go, why would they do that? That's the silly thing to do. Except for if you are a client in a roaming environment and you know you're, it's, it's a device that moves a lot, what if the reason I dropped off was because I physically got out of the range of my AP? Rather than take the time to go, oh, that didn't work, let's change 256 QAM 304 coding, try 780, that didn't work, 650, that didn't work, 585, that didn't work, 520, that didn't work, 390, and slowly climb up the stack, they say, am I even in range of the AP? Yes, and then they build their self back down and over and down and over. Some go diagonal, some go up, some change back and forth, and it's crazy that the same manufacturer, same device, doesn't do the same thing twice. Years ago, I did a Wi-Fi stress test. We put uh, 30 iPads in a room and tested which AP could handle vi streaming video, full motion, 1080p video, to 30 iPads simultaneously. And sorry, it's not a surprise anymore, but none of them could. <laughs> but we tried a couple years later to repeat the test with out of telephone AC. We took a bunch of clients, identical iPads, 12 of them, 12 identical AC Samsung tablets, and put them on a table and did the test. So instead of a single test, we did them all simultaneously. And every time we ran the test, what we found is some iPads went up, some went diagonal, some went left, some jumped over this corner and built their way back. Every time we ran the test, they did it differently. These are very sensitive algorithms. The counterintuitive part of this is we think we know what, they're, what it's doing, but until you stop, follow uh, the advice of others before me, and learn protocol analysis and watch the actual traffic, you won't see the path that they're going. And if you're designing for a specific client, you better know what his characteristics are. Some of the green diamond pieces that we don't even know about, because the vendors don't tell us, they're white list, they're gray list, they're black list. The last time I did this, you treated me this way, so this time I'm not going to use you the same way also have effect inside these stacks. The last time I went up, it wasn't very successful. So this time I'm gonna try something else. They have a lot of heuristics in there. They're not just simple, oh, who's louder? I'm gonna go to the louder one. They're trying to think a little more. And then we get even more complex. Same data, we just put some more fields in here. And this is thanks to Revolution Wi-Fi. I took his data plus the previous one, mixed them together and maybe gave it a little color. And now it's saying, oh, now, why did something move? I don't have a space for, to get to 866, so let's just pick another one this time. Let's pick over here. There, oh, there's my 866. So 866 means if I have 80 megahertz, two spatial streams, this is my target. I need an RSSI of 51 and an SNR of 37. That's not a guarantee. Just because I have them doesn't mean it gets it. Andrew went through, and if you want to find out the details of where it came, he has a whole blog page of where these came from, from a whole variety of vendors. But it gives us an idea when we're looking and troubleshooting to say, why did it move up? What do I need in order to maintain this? Do I currently have it? 
How many times have you designed to neg 51 everywhere? That, that's not our design. Uh, but if we're designing here to 65, we might be able to maintain one of these. And, but that's 65, but that's a 21. We designed a 25, but we didn't, don't have quite the, the RSSI. And then you have all the changes in the clients. Another counterintuitive thing that we th don't think about very much is we think clients are clients are clients are clients. We design for Wi-Fi. Because our customers ask us nice things like, yeah, when we say, what devices do you want to support? They say, all of them. Isn't that what they want? They just want all devices to work. So we design for all, everything. Yeah, we can do that. No, that's because all devices aren't equal. I had a customer uh, told me explicitly, please design this park, really large park, for Galaxy S3s to work. So, very specific. I said, where did you pick the S3 from? They said, well, we have a whole range of, uh, wow, that's weird, hi. <laughs> I blanked it on purpose, dude, man. <laughs> um, okay, but it's okay, you're, you're right. Uh, we, we put on a, they said Galaxy S3, and, it, and this is when S5s were already around. This is a kind of an old phone, and by the way, it has a terrible Wi-Fi chip. And I said, you know, if you, you do this, S3 is going to make my job hard. I'm going to have to put more APs in there because it's got this really old-fashioned thing. And they go, nope, nope, we tested. We tested 30 phones. It was the worst. So if you can make the worst work, then everything else is done. And then I did a really dumb thing as a consultant. The, when we're doing the final report, it's all installed, finished, and we're having the handover meeting with everyone else, including their bosses. The last slide was, if you had picked an S5, you would have saved $102,000. That was not politically, I, don't, I haven't worked with them again. Um, <laughs> but it was true. They picked the wrong thing to design for. So we, we keep thinking we need to be des designing our Wi-Fi, and we're talking about, in fact, Devin has a quote, and I, and I totally agree. We could probably get away with using two stream N designs, and it would handle almost all of our needs. But that's not what we buy today. We're buying for the future. We're buying, you know, yes, I can make the S3 work, but that's way too expensive to do. So when your customers ask for, well, well Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi, it's just going to work. Yeah, that's not true. And so it's intuitively, th and they think that because it got the Wi-Fi sticker, it's the same thing. And I can tell you, having had a very intense discussion with some folks at Wi-Fi Alliance, they are not, absolutely not going to change their brand. You will not see Wi-Fi voice grade because they think that, that dilutes their brand. But wouldn't we like to see, we, we could say to our customers, we'll design to Wi-Fi voice grade, and as long as you have a Wi-Fi voice grade device that's been tested and proven and tested roaming, our stuff's going to work. But we don't have that. But the consumer's mind still thinks Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi, and the Wi-Fi Lance marketing team goes, yes, we did it. We've convinced everyone Wi-Fi is the same. And they have. There you go. Another analogy. I like using analogies. Now I live out west in the part of the country that nothing grows unless you have irrigation. Joel can relate. We have these big things called pivots. It's a big arm and has irrigation things on it. They circle around. Some of them are a quarter mile long. But if we can put water in ground, it grows. Now if I'm thinking as a farmer, and we think farms are farms are farms, and from a Wi-Fi standpoint, our customers think, well, Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. You, you, you go, you get four bars, you're done. But if you're going to be growing cotton or wheat, those are two entirely different crops. They need water. They need land. You need to cultivate them. You need to fertilize them, and then you harvest them. But the difference is, up front, cotton needs 4.3 times more wheat, more water than wheat. If I use rice here, it would be even worse. Now, to take that analogy back to, to Wi-Fi, what client are you going to put in? A client that needs a lot of network, a little bit of network? Is it persnickety about how it needs its network device? Like a, a voice grade client needs 64K for its codec. Woohoo! That's like teeny, teeny little pipe. 
but it, it re-cares about how that 64K comes to it. BitTorrent, big huge pipe, give it the biggest pipe you want, that doesn't care all that much. FTP, also really resilient. What are the clients we're getting? How much water are they gonna need? Now earlier I said that book uh, made to stick from the Heath brothers. One of the places it makes it sticky is if you can explain this to your customer while you're talking about, Mr. Customer, what, what, what devices do you want? And we're making lists of, in Devon's term, least capable, most important devices. We wanna know what we're designing for. And you explain the wheat and the cotton or if you live where they grow rice, use rice. Now you can use it as a shorthand. As they're going down, they say, oh yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're designing iPads, running full motion video. Oh, cotton. You put that on the cotton side of the page. And they're like, what are you doing? Oh, cotton. And then after you do it a couple times, you explain it to them, and now you have a shorthand that you can talk to them about things that seem to be very precise and technical in a really simple term that they can then understand. And those kind of terms get very sticky. Another fairly complex thing that we, I'm not gonna, don't worry, I'm not gonna delve into this one. But the idea is we think things are the same. The intuitive part of us goes, yeah, we're gonna send traffic from D to A, D to A. Other than from D to C, I have destination source. Coming out of C, I have destination source transmitter and receiver. I added two more addresses. And how do those addresses flow? And how do the addresses change? And what are those two DS bits doing along the way? If we're troubleshooting, we have to know about these things. They're not intuitive. I don't know anyone who just goes, oh yeah, that's, that, that's what that second DS bit means. You gotta think about them, you gotta study them. So some things that feel intuitive, it's just like ethernet, aren't. Now, here's a fun one. I use a, I will share with you secret sauce. Okay, it's not a protractor. It's called a gnonometer. I can't even pronounce it. It's a medical device that people who do uh, physical therapy use. So if you go, you break your arm, you go into the doctor, and he says, oh, you need to go see the physical therapist because you can't move it. He puts this on and he goes, if you exercise every day, pretty soon you'll be at this percent and our target is this percent. And then you go practice and you, till you get it the right place. Anyway, that's what this is for. But I use it to talk about antennas. You don't need one of these. You have one with you right now. Ready, let's try it as a group. Put out your hand and show me with your hand at arm's length, 90 degree angle. You can just use one hand. You don't need to do the whole thing. Just <laughs> one, it, it all works with the single hand. So there we go, 90 degrees, 90 is easy. 30, 30 is a peace sign. How do I know? Because I measured it. <laughs> well, mine is a 30. You might want to measure yours, it's different. For me, 45 is if I squeeze it. Oh, 45, yep. And you can also test that because if you do two 45s, you get a 90. 60, 120, your body has some amazing pieces that help you. This just helps get a little more accurate. Now one of the counterintuitive things we think about, we use antennas and we say, we're gonna buy a 30 degree antenna. Whoa. And then we go on the map and we draw a 30 degree circle. Oh, it's, it's where it's gonna go. I measured. Manufactured, I got a picture even. So this picture happens to be a 60 degree antenna. And how do we know that? It's because at 60 degrees, 30 up from center, is where it crosses the 3 dB down line. That's, in our industry, how we define it. In the cell industry, they use 5 dB down, so the same antenna might have a different number for them. But for us, this is a 60 degree antenna. I kind of highlighted where those things cross with the little arrows. And we would sell this and we would buy one as a 60 degree antenna. And we would think, 60 degree. I would hold it and say, well, okay, if I put it here, there's the coverage pattern. Well, oh, I put one here, there's it go. If I move over here, I measure, I measure. What we're not thinking about, and this is the counterintuitive part, it's not where the 3 dB down line goes. Let's walk through some math for a second. If I'm designing for neg 60, you might not because that's kind of hot, but it makes the math for my demonstration really easy. So if we, if we were designing for neg 60, what would it be right here?
Make 63. Some people know how to subtract three from numbers. Very good. I like that. Now, those of you who said 57, you got to work on your minus signs. So, so here we have neg 60. This is 63. What is it over here where it crosses the 20 dB down line? What? Neg 80. Is neg 80 within my CCA threshold? Am I going to have cochial interference at neg 80? Unless you get your RxSOP things and you type around that, it's going to be there. So we are thinking, oh yeah, we've got this nice 60 degree antenna, but we actually have 120 degrees of cochial interference. Now the manufacturers of these antennas aren't really proud and say, yeah, we got this really what? No, they're like, we got the narrowest part. And they don't tell you where the other part is. Even if you look just at the 10 dB down line, it's um, over 90 degrees. It's almost 105 when I measured it last night at 10 dB down. That's neg 70. At neg 70, you're still connected to me. At neg 70, apples won't even roam. And so you're thinking you've got these directional antenna patterns and, oh, they're going to come leave here and go roam there. It looks so good on the map. And then the clients don't act that way. So let's think about that a little more. I do not know who Wi-Fi Hulk is. I wish I did. I wish it was me so I could Wi-Fi Hulk because green is not good. I teach lots of, yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. I'll be here all week. Green is not good, and yet every single vendor who sells any kind of survey software, their default screen shows this garbage. And your customers go, oh, it's all green. I just love it when I go into customers and say, you, you don't need a survey. I already have one. And I go, is it all green? Yeah, it's all green. So why are you calling me to troubleshoot your Wi-Fi? Well, the Wi-Fi is not, but, but it's all green. And they get confused. And I'm like, green doesn't mean good. Well, what does it mean? It means it's green. <laughs> and if you want me to show you, I can make it turn orange and not change your data. Would you like it red? What color would you like it? It's a total variable number. There's numbers underneath this, and all the green is is somebody assigned green to that number. That's it. And worse, we said, show me everything. All my neighbors, all my friends, all the rogues, all the channels, all the co-channel friends, all rolled into one screen, which shows you only one number. What is the winner? Maybe this comes from Olympics, and, and we like to get gold medals out. This is the green medal. At every single location, this is showing who's the strongest RSSI. And they're so strong, they're green. So we put a green dot there. Funny thing is, clients don't go around looking, hmm, I wonder who the winner is right here. It could be a neighbor be the winner. I'm not going to join the neighbors. It could be an SSID I'm not on. I'm not going to join that one. It could be one that's not even mine. Could be a, it could be all sorts of things. It could be green here, but I associate the AP over there, and I'm still roaming, and I'm sticky. Showing green does not mean good. We need to look into the details about what's going on underneath. We need to evaluate the information AP at a time. Is each AP doing its job? Was it supposed to cover this area? Does it have a steep edge? Is it a circus tent, or is it a mesa? I want it to be a rolling hill, that as the client climbs up, he has a nice strong signal, and as he slowly goes down the other side, I have a nice slow, g oh, it's getting worse. Bye-bye. And I grab another one who's coming along. But if I have a mesa, it's like, oh, this is great, this is great, oh, and you fall off the cliff. And then you have to roam instantly. And then there's people who say, oh, it's okay. We put APs in hallways so that when you walk and you're at the corner, I, we put it right at the intersection. So as you turn the corner, you never drop off. At this corner, you're going <laughs> to drop off at that corner. Well, we have an AP over there on that corner. True. But if I'm on this one and as I turn the corner down there, I have an AP that I can jump to, but I'm going to lose this one within five or six feet, which is too fast for the roam to happen, and we'll still have roaming issues. This is an old. I just found this crazy looking picture. VLANs, SSIDs. They're the same thing. Okay, that's the intuitive idea. Because I can tie a VLAN to an SSID. And so all of a sudden our customers are thinking, SSIDs equal VLANs. 
because VLANs equal SSIDs, so they're the same, and then the whole thought process goes along, and they're not. Has anyone, I don't even have to see your hands raised, because <laughs> I know the answer. Has anyone ever run a VLAN on a hub? And I know there's some of you old enough. What, you ran a VLAN on a hub? Kudos, man. That's, that's gutsy move. Because uh, it does nothing. VLANs and SSIDs aren't the same. In SSIDs, we have this big collision domain. Just because I can tie them to VLANs does not mean they're even close to each other. Uh, I threw this one for fun. Uh, Counterintuitive part, I run across a lot with more Soho. Point the antenna where you want it to go. That's where I want the coverage. So I want the coverage upstairs, and I want it over by the kitchen. So this is the best way to hook this one up. We're going to get some great coverage there. Uh, another good one. This one is uh, counterintuitive because we've been told from AT&T for years, more bars, better. I got more bars in more places. I must have better things. And we think that RSSI alone, more bars, is going to make our Wi-Fi better. And it doesn't. We also run across this one every now and then. Minus dBs, good or bad? I actually was at a school board meeting, and I mentioned we designed to, at the time, neg 70 dB. And the lady who's at the microphone talking goes, yeah, that's 70 to bads. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, it's got a big B. The big B's for bad, and negative means it's bad, and it's the bad. <laughs> no. And I'm like, it's closer to zero. And she's like, I mean, it was a school district, so I asked the school board whether they taught negative numbers to their people, and they didn't appreciate that very much. Um, <laughs> but you can with this thing, and if they don't understand DB, anyone ever like say, oh, think of the children. The Wi-Fi is going to hurt the children. And so I just ask, how did you call to complain? Well, I used my cell phone to call the principal and say, please help my daughter. She's sick because of Wi-Fi is harming her. And then when you do the math in front of them, where you take and you say, a nightlight is four watts. Do you put a nightlight near your child? Well, yeah, it keeps her stuck, she doesn't cry. Do you use a cell phone? Cell phone, maximum one watt. Do you let your daughter borrow your phone? No, my daughter has her own phone, okay. Would you let your daughter hold something in her hands that was so dangerous, it was 10 billion times less than a phone? Now, billion's a big number. A billionth is a super, super, super tiny number, blows people's brains. And they're just like, I can't think about something that small. So you say, you start at a thousandth. If it was a thousandth as strong, would you mind? No, because she has a phone. How about a hundred thousand, a million, ten million, a hundred million, a billion? And when you get to ten billion, they're thinking that has no value at all. And you say, and that's what we designed for. That's the value in watts of neg 70. Not intuitive. I love this one. First set. I didn't know we had first sets and second sets. The second sets are only half overlapping. They're not, they're, it's okay. We can use them because they're just half overlapping. Rate limit. I turn down the limit. People can only use five mega piece. And your utilization goes up is what you think. But in reality, when you test this, you turn the rate limit up, you take the rate limit off, network utilization goes down. Same with channel utilization. We, one of the counterintuitive things about Wi-Fi compared to, to other things where people think they have value, like water or food or some scarce resource, if I give it to you, you can't have it. But in Wi-Fi, the thing we have least of is airtime. So if you want to watch a Netflix movie, I'm going to give it to you as absolute fast as you can so you give me back the thing that I have the least of. I want you taking it as fast as possible on the fastest possible data rate and get off my air so I can give the next Netflix to the next guy. When Wi-Fi problems aren't, homage to Glenn, different data set, same concept. Uh, do I have bad Wi-Fi here? Anyone? Is this, is this a bad network? 
Or is it bad Wi-Fi? What's the problem? You think the customer is happy with this? And yet, they're screaming fast. SNR 41, the thing's rocking, and yet we're still not happy. So I have a whole bunch more of these. I have a, a blog that just lists all of them. All these issues that you think are counterintuitive aren't. Here's just a little one. It's not intuitive that if you mix red, green, and blue, you get white on light. It's opposite with, with pink. Fun one to end on. Read. Push to close open tightly, which do you want? So which way is up? Now, I, this one is just an extra put in here, so it's going to show up. I've got a couple seconds left. If you want to engage in this community, and some of you are new, you haven't joined the community, I definitely strongly suggest you get on Twitter, uh, get on Slack, one of the two. This community is very, very active on Twitter. And then ask with a, with a specific issue. Don't say something like, I have this problem. You've got 140 characters. It's not very much. But ask for help about something. Engage with someone. Everyone I know who's on Twitter is glad to answer a specific question. But here's the, a lot of people do that step. But to engage and be part of this, report. I took the URL you sent me, and this is what I found, and it helped answer my problem. You start a conversation. Better yet, do number four, write your own blog. You ask for help about a problem. You were thinking about something. You needed some help. They gave you some information. You might have got three or four or five articles from it. Write up and then write what you learned. Just your own process will help. And by then sharing that, it's a rinse and repeat, and we do it for everyone. So vendor neutral training for CBNP. WM Pro's website, we have lots and lots of free resources. We have a lending library that if you want to get involved and have, uh, I don't know, some APs, uh, enterprise class APs to try to practice to do stuff on, they're available. All you have to do is pay shipping. And that's all.